So good afternoon, everyone, and a very happy new year to all of you. This is the first session of this new year and the ninth one in this second wave of our only one theme talk series. So as all of you are aware, this talk series is focused around innovation management topics. And the topic for today is only protecting AI-based software inventions. Our speaker for today is Hasit Seth. And let me briefly introduce Hasit before he begins his talk. Hasit is a computer science graduate after which he has done LLB and LLM with a gold medal from Mumbai University. He later did a LLM in IP from University of New Hampshire in the US. His interest areas include law, technology, deal negotiation, economics, and art. Hasid has worked as a counsel in the Bombay High Court. His key focus is on arbitration, civil, and writ litigation. He has negotiated many deals, most of them involving technology and related services. He has formally studied negotiations at Harvard Law School's program on negotiation. Over the past 20 years, Hasid has been a partner at a law firm, general counsel for a MNC, a startup founder, and has worked in the U.S. with two law firms doing patent litigation and prosecution. With this brief introduction, Hasid, welcome to the session and handing over the session to you. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Mukda. Uh, and everybody at Venture Center. Am I audible, visible? Yes, you are audible and visible. Okay, audible and visible. Okay, I'm sharing my presentation. So let's see if that is also... Yes, we can see your presentation, as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for the confirmation. So, well, uh, almost good evening to everybody. Uh, if you are from a different time zone, then... Uh, whatever is the greeting appropriate to that time zone uh, as such. So I'm going to speak about protecting artificial intelligence-based software inventions. Uh, this is a new exciting area. Actually, it's an old exciting area because uh, the attempts to achieve artificial intelligence have been going on since 1970s. Uh, then... It was called fourth generation computing. Uh, and you had languages like Lisp uh, and Prolog, uh, which kind of promised that we'll do symbolic processing and achieve uh, some sort of intelligence, I mean. And uh, it started very rudimentary uh, with expert systems like Mycin, uh, which would uh, sort of uh, mimic a doctor doing diagnostics uh, with symptoms being fed into it and uh, there being a database uh, out of uh, which, you know, like some logical conclusion based on a series of combining factors could predict, you know, like that you were suffering from or are likely to suffer from certain kind of ailments. But that was then, and things have changed a lot. Uh, the primary factor uh, that has changed is just the amount of data we have. It's like, you know, petabytes or whatever the highest measure may be. Uh, I mean, it's with that level of data is being generated. So that's massive. And that has given rise to the field of machine learning because uh, lots of data and lots of computing power, particularly cloud-based computing power, uh, that has give open up large uh, possibilities. So uh, to give you an idea, the very early uh, system for distributed processing uh, was uh, a system uh, called SETI, which was a software-based search for extraterrestrials. Uh, and you had to download that SETI module and it would, uh, by in the background, it would download certain data packets, process and return them to the SETI system. It was essentially radio astronomy data collected over by different uh, like ra uh, radio uh, telescopes, I mean, around the world. And that was being processed. The idea was that you were sort of helping a centralized system uh, through distributed processing to process a lot of data. 
but that's where the idea started floating around that can we have like very large stores of data being processed uh, around the world. And that's like from client server computing, we went on to like the cloud uh, and cloud just normalized things in the sense that you didn't need to worry where the background servers were, you didn't need to worry where the backups were being taken and you also didn't need to worry much about latency uh, because content distribution networks, et cetera, uh, provided very good uptime. Uh, uh, players like Google and Amazon with AWS and Google Cloud provide you almost 99.99% uptime, uh, which is which is very high, very high. Uh, but they have like multiple level of redundancies and everything built in. Anyway, so all these developments taken together uh, were simply like the infrastructure that was available. But uh, the software to harness all these kind of elements into something way more powerful uh, wasn't around. The first signs we saw of it uh, were from Google itself. Uh, Google started providing uh, fairly intelligent searches uh, in the sense that, you know, you very first or second page of the search would bring up the links which you were exactly looking for. Nobody knew how it did. Uh, I mean, in terms of like guessing what you're looking for, but it essentially did something which is uh, very uh, rudimentary, I would say, you know, discrete mathematics and graph theory, uh, whereby it just connected, you know, to links and uh, put some statistical weight to those links that if a, a particular page is being linked by many pages, then it must be very important. And even then, even now with, you know, like a number of tweaks to its algorithm, Google still ranks, you know, uh, some pages as way high above other pages. For example, like government pages and uh, United Nations pages, et cetera, which are highly reliable according to Google because there are lots of other pages linking to it. Uh, uh, don't, don't need to get into like there was a backrub algorithm by which uh, uh, different pages were uh, the, this is the Google founders uh, paper and patent I mean by which uh, they figured out, you know, like uh, some measures to understand that linkages between pages actually are valuable weight, weighting, weighing data in the sense that you can put weights to those linkages, I mean. But that was still rudimentary and Google started a lot of experimentation with what it would know call as AI or, you know, like essentially machine learning. So the first science of it that we got a taste of was through the Google's correction mechanism. And if you typed a wrong spelling, Google would automatically, you know, search for what would be the correct spelling. And versions of it, uh, I mean, uh, along with versions of it appeared in Google Docs and all that, that uh, all the very advanced spell checking kind of like mechanisms came in. But it also appeared in something else in the Google universe. And uh, that uh, the something else where you could see the signs of AI uh, were in the way the Google search pages. I mean, Google search pages uh, at a very fast pace based on kind of look ahead algorithms and other things where it could kind of guess, you know, what kind of page uh, you're looking for next time. I mean, it had a large cache of everything uh, and it could mine everything ahead and keywords and all kinds of analysis and it got into all kinds of data, uh, some licensed, some unlicensed, whatever it may be. But that that's the kind of way it worked. But what, 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 what was missing was, you know, still the math behind it, that how do you have a model or a math tied which would generate something as an extraordinary kind of an application. And surprisingly, uh, I'll be talking about that paper. Uh, surprisingly, that step actually came from Google, but the capitalization of it in the sense of like taking the most of the benefits of it was done by a very nifty small startup which beat Google to uh, what would be the most uh, viable form of natural language processing algorithm around, which is ChatGPT. So we'll all, we'll talk all about it. And, but 
Uh, I am not here to talk about what Google's doing or what ChatGPT, OpenAI are doing. Uh, I'm sure you all are more familiar with it than me. Uh, maybe coding with their APIs and other things uh, while we talk. But what I'm going to talk is how the patent system and overall intellectual property systems are struggling to protect AI-based software inventions. So this is my background, which Mukda has already said. So the, my talks has like four components that what are software inventions, uh, and what are the problems associated with patenting software inventions or copywriting them? Uh, and what are the unique protectable features of AI inventions as we understand them now? Uh, what inventions, you know, like which include AI and uh, there is another aspect of it is AI as the inventor. So it's very early days for uh, like the debate around AI as inventor. Uh, they think the powers that we think that we have found out an easy way by saying that only humans can be inventors and AI can't be inventor. But it's a matter of time that whether we invent something different in the sense, not the traditional patent system, but more of like uh, a repository of AI generated content and code and inventions, I mean. So somebody may come up with that in private sector. We just don't know. All right, so what were the software? So most of the AI resides in software, right? I mean, there is little bit here and there in terms of uh, like it being uh, burnt in, into like, you know, the mechanisms around microfluidics or uh, around, uh, you know, like robotics and all that. But most of it is in the software part of things, I mean, as such. So let's look at software invention. The patent system was created around machines or chemicals, I mean. So what the kind of inventions it covered were mechanical inventions, electrical inventions, electronic toward, I mean, uh, in the 80s, I mean, sort of thing, uh, when the transistor came out and all those things. Uh, then the chemicals uh, obviously were uh, earliest candidates for patenting have been around by, I just use the word in a very loose fashion. I mean, any substances of any kind. Obviously, no, I'm not included in this are, you know, like the bio inventions uh, or uh, bio sequences, I mean, uh, genome sequencing and other things, which are also patentable now by deposition of uh, those genome sequences uh, under uh, what is known as a Bucharest Treaty or something like that. Uh, but that's a little apart, but core of the patent system still revolves around machines or chemicals. Uh, machine, there is a book called, you know, like the patent uh, drafting platinum claims by uh, Landis, uh, the most standard book. Uh, and it, it defines machine as a system of cooperating parts. There are different parts and they cooperate together. And while writing a patent or claiming something, you... Uh, kind of describe it as a machine which is at rest, not moving, but it is a set of parts which are cooperative or linked to some other parts. And when uh, they op operate, uh, those particular linkages are essentially what gives the machine its particular identity. Uh, most of the machines involve some kind of transformation of energy or form, which would be in chemicals. Uh, and that forms as work. But software, I mean, you have a problem right there. Uh, it's not material in any way. Uh, it's just code which the microprocessor understands and it twiddles uh, bits and bytes and memories around it or signals around it. Uh, and yet, you know, like a lot gets done with it. So it just doesn't fit, you know, the categories of this mechanical, electro electrical, electronic or chemical kind of sub, uh, substances or machines, uh, which would be the most natural fit to the patent system. Uh, but it gets the job done. So what do we do with it? So we have, uh, there were like, you know, almost like, you know, I call them the blind man and the elephant time in six blind men and the elephant story. Uh, everybody's kind of like, uh, you know, experiencing a part of the, whole and uh, determining that I found out, you know, like what's the best way to deal with it, but none of them got it right. 
So initial proposals were that let's use copyright as a protector of software inventions uh, because uh, it's, I mean, the coding system is called a language. And if you have written output, it looks like a book or uh, literature. So it must be protectable under copyrights as a work of liter literature. And then you had modifications because this was really not literature in the sense that a machine, it was literature which machine could understand or interpret. So that's not what traditional literature does. Uh, so they had special provisions modifying the, uh, the copyright laws uh, for computer programs because that was supposed to be the most natural kind of protection available to it. But problem is that uh, software, uh, copyrights uh, for software, they offer minimal protections in the sense, unless it is uh, like uh, identical copying, you know, like uh, word to word copying or bit to bit copying, there is really no protection. Plus, I mean, copyright also has a very strong fair use system whereby uh, things could be used for educational or other purposes. Uh, so you had lots of problems. Plus the, the copyright system was never designed to capture the inventive part or the element in it. So there you had a lot of problems, I mean, but still software is copyrighted by some people. But I mean, that's definitely not the most favored medium today to get some kind of protection. Uh, different infringement standards of copyrights versus patterns. This is a problem because uh, in patterns, you know, if you have ABC elements of a pattern claim, uh, and if they read on, as it said, on a particular device, which is A, B, and C, it may have other things like D and E and or whatever other elements. That's infringement right there. Copyright doesn't work that way. Copyright infringement has many, many aspects to it. I mean, first thing, it uh, independent creation uh, is a defense in copyrights, but in, it's not a bad defense in patents. Uh, inventive ideas uh, lost in merely protecting expression of idea under the copyright is a problem in the sense that, you know, copyright simply is not a system by which they can capture inventive ideas. So the USPTO in early, you know, like 90s, uh, they came up with something, you know, through the cases. I mean, all this happened through the cases because US has kept its patent law quite stable. US 101. 35 USC 101, 102, 103 are the, the holy trinity of uh, US patent law, which they have kept it technology neutral. They have not modified it to cover this or that technology. Uh, they just say that, you know, uh, utility, novelty, non-obviousness, all of them taken together is good enough, like a standard to capture uh, like any kind of invention. Uh, so they are living with that. But other, pat other patent offices and patent systems have not taken very kindly to software patents and they've been going around with you know trying to <laughs> swat flies that uh, we know you know like what is to be patented or what is not based on many uh, like factors so Borigard claim which said that you know uh, let's call it you know like a computer program product so that makes it a product patent instead of a process patent uh, all right I mean, uh, that was, uh, there was a time when people used to write pra, uh, like patent claims in this fashion, but uh, but it's still, I mean, after calling it pra, computer program product and it would have like a method claim uh, below it. Uh, EU patent office had its own ideas that, you know, what, to, what should we include in uh, like a software patent criteria and what we should exclude. So they came up with this idea of technical effect. So we, Indian Patent Office, copied the same idea from them uh, that we'll give patents only to, you know, like uh, pat, uh, inventions which have some technical effect. And only God knows what was technical effect because uh, what's around there to not to have some technical effect, I mean. Uh, so it was vague definition which was just there because uh, all these patent offices struggle, uh, you know, trying to like avoid what were, uh, a notorious category called business method patents and also like vague software patents which uh, sort of the terminology to describe them was uh, quite awful I mean and so they had a problem that how do you even reject these inventions I mean so USPTO has stuck to you know like 101, 102, 103 as I said 
uh and but they gave a lot of rejections you know under 101 uh as the subject matter was not patentable i mean to many things in software patents but ultimately they have come around that this is the technology that's going to live and it's everywhere i mean you know in everything electronic there is software so then how do you say that you know this is not an invention so uh that's been the story of you know like that six blind men and the elephants uh it, it's it's never worked to you know like find the equivalence of software structures in the physical world because software is abstract and abstract methods are not patentable so patent office and patent law has actually set up the battle right there that uh, the software tries to define the phenomena in some way that if this is done then this will happen or it's not even i mean cal is not even worried about describing the output uh, it just assumes that some output like this would come uh, and it has a very non standard terminology in the sense if you look at software patents the terminology is borrowed from here and there and we'll see that in chat gpt they have borrowed a word called transformers uh, this is has nothing to do with the transformers movie but uh, that's a heavily used word and uh, there is also like a word for uh, like uh, i mean a phrase call self attention i mean self attention engine now god knows where you would find you know like a physical equivalent of these two things transformers and self attention engines so that's the problem with software because it's so futuristic uh, that things are described with whatever easily available words and phrases are around uh, but they don't by themselves mean anything i mean you know like what is a self attention engine nothing you might call somebody jokingly as a self attention engine but that's about it i mean uh, nothing else all right so uh um uh we had a silent compromise you know between the patent offices patent law and uh, uh like uh, others i mean uh, sorry i skipped a slide uh yes so the software the patent systems the patent offices and the software guys who were interested in patenting uh because of this flip flops you know the major creators of software the standard big creators like IBM Microsoft uh Google they did patent but they really didn't take it up as seriously in terms of suing people or doing anything else they licensed or they only used it to license out their portfolios and create cross licensing arrangements that i'll not sue you and you will not sue me so that was a cross license simply based on a, a pact to not sue each other uh then the systems have been allowing patenting of software day in and day out given that there is so much of filing going around uh but to they do try to maintain some level of technicalness of the invention uh and they the patent systems right now are simply pretending that they are not merely algorithms but uh, all said and done the idea may be hidden between many algorithms but it is still like an algorithmic invention uh, as such so that's the struggle of patent systems with the software inventions uh, let's look at some of the unique uh you know protectable features uh, of ai inventions then what they are so this is the 2017 seminal paper by waswani et al uh, which led to you know like a lot of thought process and uh you know software being coded into what would be called as transformers uh and that actually is the heart of gpt i mean and we'll see how that goes it's it's not easy to follow paper unless you are into a bit of symbol processing and math and uh, uh software i mean but hang on i'll try to simplify it as far as possible and as much as required to get on with you know like the ai protecting aspect of it so this image comes from the waswani's paper that what really is happening so you have inputs uh, which are being encoded uh, you know and it's all happening within layers of neural networks 
so neural network is essentially it mimics you know this kind of a structure where it would have layers which are hidden too which would not be obvious to anybody but it's a system which is created like connect interconnections to each other very much similar like the uh, human neurons and dendrons and all that kind of stuff uh, but the way it works is you know like it works through training data sets so uh, there is two kinds of training i mean there are two kinds of trainings one is supervised learning and unsupervised learning so both of them are required with the current state of things i mean there is nothing which you can simply you know dump data in and it will give you output the, the models have to be trained and tweaked i mean as such how does that work so all the neural networks i mean of this kind connections here there are star fishes so what's been abstracted out of those star fishes are a certain kind of shape and certain kind of surface patterns that would be observable in a star fish so if you had a camera uh, which would be you know recording imagery like a camera on a tesla car or something uh and it was to process that data and find a meaning out of it or ascribe a meaning to that particular thing it's going to find out you know what features are there in the da spatial data that has come in and <coughs> that model will have to be trained earlier on recognizing these things as such so starfish it recognizes in, in this way that you have a surface which is of you know like roughly a star shape and you have uh like a surface patterns of small small circles or oval shapes i mean and that would be like this thing now you had some other sea creatures of you know what is like a pumpkin kind of shape uh and that would be abstracted into that in 2d form it would have an oval this thing plus it would have a pattern of like stripes i mean which are stretched across but if you had one of these shapes with the uh, surface pattern of a star shape that's bound to get your system confused and that training data that whatever neural network is built on such a aspect that it's actually borrowing identifiable features from some other rec uh, recognized element then that would be considered a weaker connection and this whole network would have like lots of weights around it and you know like uh hidden layers of neural networks and all that a complex kind of an arrangement as such but then what happens essentially they used a lot of vector math uh whereby uh uh you know like dot products or sort of free eigen values of those vectors are in a complex way calculated to create like an output sequence of tokens i mean the input sequence is embedded and output sequence is generated but in the middle what you have this 2000 paper said is that uh, you would have what would be a self attention engine in the sense the engine which is uh, codifying the input coming data or already using the pre codified data would be very self aware about what it's doing in outputs so that's the broad general idea of it it's quite dense but uh, not too illogical to understand now what what are the problems associated with patenting this kind of stuff one of the big problems associated with patenting this kind of stuff is that most of the progress that was made in terms of patenting inventions in software was around code that if there could be structures or models inside the code uh, which would be candidates for patenting based on the fact that they were uh, useful novel and non obvious uh, but now you have data coming in because all these models ai uh, like applications don't work without a training data set being given to it plus they themselves you know like doing a lot of learning from newer data patterns that come to it so now if you it's data plus code which makes an ai invention run how how will uh, like the patent law protect both the data the relationships and the code that goes with it uh there is going to be a struggle and there is going to be a lot of chaos with it the reason for that is that patent law has an allergy to printed matter it doesn't like you know like it doesn't think that what's printed on paper can be 
invention. To give you an example, uh, er, there were an early attempts to pattern double entry accounting, but double entry accounting is what? Just a T-shaped, you know, like an account structure uh, and a bunch of conventions that what is debit and credit and, you know, which way like cash goes and cash comes in and all that. So it didn't allow that to be like patented. I mean, the double entry accounting system, as you know, was invented by the Italians, but nobody got a patent on it as such. But that <laughs> legacy has been carried on <clears throat> also for this reason that, uh, excuse me, for the reason that printed matter was supposed to be more suitable for copyright protection rather than the patent protection. Uh, and this is carried on to something which is uh, which is actually an invention. But, you know, like the patent system doesn't recognize our fonts. So patents over fonts have not been granted, rejected for this reason that it's just printed matter. And if data is going to be and data and relationships are going to be uh, candidates for patenting, then, I mean, in AI inventions, we'll have problems of printed matter and abstractness that, it doesn't look very definite. Plus, I mean, how do you describe this kind of like, you know, large uh, data set? So that's going to be a bit of a challenge. I mean, how that happens, I mean. So what's protectable in the artificial intelligence domain? Training data sets could be protected whether under copyright or in some way, you know, like where the code how the code kind of populates the data set, interprets it, accesses it in some way. Uh, training models could be candidates for patenting. Uh, transformative mechanisms like the transformer in the chat GPT, uh, that's actually a general purpose transformer that GPT stands for it. So transformer is the key part of it. Uh, then, you know, methods to reduce error rate, uh, errors, I mean, because there are lots of false positives and there are lots of, like stories about Tesla stopping, thinking that, you know, something ahead of it is a danger while there was nothing really like a danger. Uh, so the false positives are a problem and any methods to improve on that could get you like patterns. Optimization methods would obviously always be category, which would be uh, the people would try to pattern those methods, I mean, uh, as such. Uh, and the outputs, I mean, what output you get, those would be likely be protected by copyright, but both copyright and, and patent offices have rejected non-human invent, uh, like authors and inventors as yet, uh, in US at least, uh, and UK, I mean, I'll talk about a case about it recently. So that, I mean, has been the challenge. So inventions that include AI, you know of them like ChatGPT or Google's Bard, Code Pilot, which Microsoft uh, like gives with its uh, Visual Studio, uh, text assistants in word processors, chatbots, uh, and you have like uh, media creators like Dali or you know there are lots of other software that create uh, which uh, which create creatives. I mean, which are uh, like creative elements. Adobe also has now products around it, and you have music loop creators and things like that. So that's the application part of it. And how we protect these things would depend on which of the parts of it we are able to claim as independent inventions and how much of the data set that goes with it will also be, can be included in patent. Maybe something similar to what's been done for the genome sequences or the bio sequences. Uh, Maybe those things, something like if we can pattern DNA sequences, which are what I mean, are just permutations, combinations of those four chemicals, ATCG, uh, then why not, you know, like the data elements, which are artificial neural networks. Let's see if, you know, like uh, the patent office would be tested trying to do that as such. Uh, but that's how what we'll see that all these applications keep coming in, patent offices would struggle to keep up with patent applications around this area. And I see a repeat of what happened in early 90s, that there will be a lot of chaos around patenting like AI-based inventions. But there is a, I mean, a flip phenomena. Let me tell you, so uh, some four or five years ago, not four or five, maybe three, three years ago, pre-pandemic, I was giving a talk 
moderating a session on blockchain inventions and i just looked up that you know ibm which is a big backer of blockchain particularly the private blockchain i mean for its logistics and other clients that how much of uh like uh, patents do they have on blockchain and what i realized is that they had less than 50 patents so you look around at you know like blockchain or bitcoin related inventions and there is hardly any action there i mean uh, around blockchain inventing which you would think that public ledger this that you know great technology and all that but there's nothing around it so i just hope that you know ai doesn't suffer the same sequence uh, because what patent office does apart from you know like granting inventions uh, for for 20 years from date of filing patent office also creates a large repository of technical human knowledge so if ai is missing from that large repository of technical human knowledge we have problems i mean as such so that's going to be a challenge and let's see how the offices deal with it i mean uh uk recently in 2023 the uk supreme court rejected the uh, an application for a soft uh, ai based <coughs> application for dabus it's called so they uh, the, the the inventor of this system actually went has applied in multiple patent offices you can go to the epo link and find out uh, you know like different patent offices different approach and different legal systems different approach to it uk has taken a strong stand that ai the inventor needs to be a human same way the us copyright has taken a stand earlier but in us no like i mean nothing reaches the supreme court very quickly somebody people have tried but supreme court has rejected attempts to you know like rule on this issue they'll really let the market figure out what should survive and what should not survive instead of you know courts mandating that this is okay this is a patentable invention this is not a patentable invention as such so that's about the end of my talk uh, we can do a few questions uh, in whichever format that mukda permits yeah um Right, we have opened up the chat box already for the questions. So, if there are any questions, please keep on uh, uh, posting there. Uh, Dr. Premnath, uh, would you like to take a few? Hello. I don't know if he's on online or maybe. Yeah, somewhere. he's here, but is there some, there's a raised hand there. Let me just check. Uh, anybody? Yeah. Bhagishri, yes, we have unmuted you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, hello, sir. It's a very wonderful talk. Yeah, go ahead, Bhagishri. Uh, are you able to... We can hear you. To... Okay. Uh, Primna's not able to unmute himself. It's, it's... Uh, okay, I just... Huh. Okay. Uh, so, uh, ahead, sir, my question is, if we write any article uh, or if we publish uh, any uh, data, so, uh, all like if it is not in a publication house, but in normal uh, publication like a paper or magazine, if we publish anything, so how can we protect our copyrights? Uh, so I mean, the the easiest thing to the answer is that you know register the copyrights, but copyright is sui generis in the sense you don't need to register it. Uh, without registration, also you get very similar protection. Except if you register, you get, you know, like a bit of uh, added advantage of ease in litigation or proving that you have the registration in a certain date of creation. But other than that, nothing. Uh, but if it's really valuable, like what you have written, then, you know, it's mm -hmm. worth doing it. But otherwise, yeah, just, you know, like it's being out there and you just don't know uh, what, what, kind of system will pick up that and you know like modify and all that and yeah you see it's it's uh, the text part is uh, i think not as shocking as you know uh, what they did with video and audio in the sense with deep fakes right i mean they have been able to mix like videos uh, to create deep fakes quite convincingly so that's going to be and it's like near like realistic i mean so that's going to be a way bigger challenge than you know like the text part of it but i think mm -hmm. you know the text guys will figure out i think the the moment chat gpt has come out 
uh, there are lots and lots of papers and research things offering around which would uh, actually figure out you know like uh, even the source from where chat gpt got his ideas or the error rates i mean how it creates errors uh, and those kind of things because as you would know and if you have tried out it's really overconfident it gives you answer whether it knows the answer or not i mean of very trivial things also so that's going to be a problem because it's really a machine without like a system without any uh, sentient identity what it's doing is it's just doing math i mean you know like vector mathematics i mean hmm. so and it thinks this is the answer i mean so that's what's happening but if you have something valuable to protect then it may be worth doing it i think the one of the bigger challenges are uh, now is that all these uh, large language models i mean are based on some sort of data collected over from data sets and there is a big fear and the chat open ai guys are battling it that they have used data without permission of others now google got away from got away doing this on the basis that oh we are only indexing it we are not really you know like using this data or minimizing the economic influence of the original creators of this data so we are only providing search we are only providing discoverability but mm -hmm. here it's not any search or discoverability here they are creating something new using the existing material i mean if it is out of copyright like uh, uh, <laughs> most of the textual databases use uh, gutenberg uh, like you know collection of open source books as input training data that's out there and they yes. could use it but very hard otherwise to say where it has come from. Uh, Thank you, sir. Dr. Prabhupada, you, had, you to wanted to ask something? Uh, yeah, question from Ayushi saying first, let her go first. Yeah, uh, okay. meanwhile, Hasif, can you just unshare your screen? Okay, I'll unshare my screen. Yeah. Yes, Ayushi, yeah. we have unmuted you. Yeah. Hello, so am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Uh, so, so basically, my question revolved around AI and accountability. Now, recently also, like we were talking about deep fakes, like in this generation where a generative AI is there and AI has its own conscience. So like the last part of our talk, which was AI as the inventor. So like it, it, the European Union has come out with AI and accountability. The US is tackling it. What yeah. is the way like with with larger reliance come larger responsibility so what is that one way to go about in an indian sort of like a landscape as to with accountability question uh, for ai yeah it's going to be a bit of a challenge you know like and what we may see is not uh like you know ai like applications standalone applications you know uh doing something which government would want to regulate but indian government is conscious i mean from whatever little i get to read uh, in public domain about ai and its implication they just don't know what to do about it i mean uh, or like is it even a near term threat or near term concern so that's what it is but <coughs> what will happen is that these algorithms are already getting into e-commerce like applications uh, so you have like things like Zomatos, Amazons, etc., using many, many elements of these AI kind of things. So let's say, for example, Amazon wants, you know, positive reviews. Uh, it can attach it to like a GPT-like system. It has its own system, also large language model, whereby it will be able to generate five-star reviews for all its products, right? Or the products it wants to sell. Now, those kind of things are going to be a problem. There is something called dark patterns and government has come out with regulations relating dark patterns in e-commerce. But that's, I think, a smaller problem. Uh, you'll have much more problems of misinformation. So when people say, oh, we are living, uh, earlier they used to say we are living in age of informa information. Now they say we are living in the age of misinformation. Now they haven't seen, you know, yet, you know, like the time when, it would be impossible to distinguish between what is the information that is created by somebody who is accountable, who or he or she is accountable, uh, or, or a company also, or it is information that is created by an algorithm without any accountability behind it. So those are going to be huge problems. And so we'll see 
all of these elements getting into banking, maybe aviation, maybe, uh, you know, like the e-commerce for sure. I mean that these AI elements will get in and then what happens that one of these things going wrong, I mean, that would be a problem. But it could also be that, you know, this makes some jobs redundant, like copywriters, right? Advertising copywriters, their jobs may become redundant because all that they do is come up with jingles and with a statistical sledgehammer like a chat GPT, you could generate jingles better than, you know, any human around. I mean, advertising jingles. So those things, I mean, would I see the, the most earliest kind of problems that will arise in India. Yep. There's one question in the chat box also. Okay. All right. Let me take it. Yeah, there is Akash. Akash's question. I'll read it out. We are informed by legal experts in similar training session that under Indian Patents Act, we can protect inventions where software plus hardware components are included. Those aspects could be patents. Uh, also, US regulation allow patent certain softwares. Could you please share? Now, I, I am amazed, you know, like that uh, in this day and age, after software patents have been around and, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of software patents have been granted, we could actually have a filter criteria which says that it should be a combination of software and hardware to be patentable. What is software which, uh, which, which runs without hardware? I mean, what kind of software runs, you know, like on its own? Would you have software which would run without hardware implement uh, some some hardware, you know, on which it is being run? Uh, so software is going to be, I mean, but what, what seemed like a very old uh, kind of an idea, software, hardware combination or a technical effect is this thing where you could perhaps, you know, say, like an embedded system, internet of things, or, you know, sensors, sensor-based things. Okay, there is an obvious connection between software and hardware there. And maybe the hardware part dominates, like in an intelligent, you know, CCTV camera, which does, you know, object tracking or something like that. But for other applications, like say, like chat GPT, what's the hardware here? It's, it's hardware, which is not even a one particular type of computer, it's on the cloud and you know, the computing power is just calculated in number of uh, like CPU cycles. And those CPU cycles may be coming from any kind of processor and any kind of servers. I mean, that is completely immaterial. So, I mean, this is very old distinction. Patent offices, which would stick with that distinction won't go anywhere uh, and they would be overwhelmed. I mean, you know, like uh, by, the kind of applications that would come, which would test limits of all the regulations. I mean, even if they have tried to filter out some of them as such. So, uh, and that's happening in, not just in the software domain, but also in the bio domain. Uh, you have so much of new kind of stuff coming in that they're struggling, except the rate of like, you know, this newer kind of stuff coming in is exponentially high in software domain. I mean, because the ease of creating abstract models uh, U.S. Uh, regulations allow, well, U.S. allows everything to be patented if it is novel, non-obvious, and this thing. And they just have one filter in 101 that it should not be an abstract idea. That's all. Yeah. Hasid, yeah. Uh, one thing, there are a few in, uh, things which I wanted to just request you to comment on. Yeah. Uh, see, what is, AI has been known for many years, right? It's yeah. nothing new, actually, right? Yeah. Um, it's just that uh, our ability to handle a lot of data, our ability to do it cheaply uh, with limited, with, uh, you know, even a phone that's available with you and so on and so forth has, is what has changed, uh, really yeah. speaking, right? So one of the interesting implications of this is uh, that I would expect that uh, previously when people used to look for prior art searches and or looking at what is inventive steps and so on and so forth, uh, where look, we're limited by people's ability to search and what they had access to, including the examiners, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow, it's actually going to be uh, an AI tool that's going to do it. Right? Yes, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and as that happens, I think, <laughs> will it squeeze the window of what can be patented for many inventors? I, I think so. I think so. You are on very right uh, track. 
because you know like patent uh, patent offices while rejecting inventions are essentially you know text comparison engines that okay here it's described with some intelligence i mean some more uh, of cognitive layering on the just the mere words i mean that okay you have described you know like a new kind of like say electrical connector uh words may be anything but it's simply like a new kind of electrical connector uh a switch or a plug or something and then you're trying to get a patent on it but if you have if the patent examiner has access to an ai engine and i would not be surprised that uspto is already developing something like this for internal use uh in terms of finding possible candidates for uh prior art uh and finding possible candidates for prior arts in very cutting edge novel areas where the terminology is not standardized but something like this kind of like uh, text processing engines uh can be easily deployed to find something which is similar and give the the uh the patent examiner three good candidates to reject you know like claims that's very very possible and it will be possible i think in less than 5 years yeah and in fact it's probably going to make it stiffer for inventors to patent anything in the future as well yes uh, yes there yes is another interesting angle to this which is that uh, in lot of these ai uh, products which uh, uh, we or ideas that people are developing uh, they are basically you know there's a data set right they work an algorithm on top of it yeah. and come up with some kind of a ai uh, algorithm them which produces some patterns or yes. recognizes some patterns, right? patterns. correct correct now uh, the the so what has changed here before if we were to take a few data sets and draw our own graphs we would still get some patterns but yeah, what so... has changed is uh, the un uh, non obvious patterns that people are able to pull out right yes yes and and the tools and methods for uh, spotting those non obvious patterns so i can tell you and i can give you a, an example from a domain which is a little different is like the pet scan machine so you have like ct scan there is you know like pet scan machines which siemens makes and i used to write patents for them so they when you do a whole body pet scan it generates massive 3d spatial data uh, of the whole body and because it's it's so good that you can actually zoom into the the you know like the most deepest level possible into the soft tissues uh you know, whatever the technology can scan so what what they have done is that in this the doctor the, the doctor would find it impossible to have a zone of interest so uh, the software that is available for it uh, actually zooms into and draws a circle around a possible polyp cyst or a tumor uh which could be of interest to the doctor uh provided they have given the right kind of prompts very similar to giving a prompt to a ch chat gpt now there what happens uh, dr premnath is that there is very sophisticated math called kernel estimation going behind it and uh, the 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 thing is that uh, at princeton there is a, la a large section of the mathematics department which works on kernel estimation and siemens has actually built their uh you know 3d spatial geom geometry processing like uh, department uh, just across the road from princeton's math department so anybody who gets a phd automatically gets a job at siemens or is already working on projects at siemens it's that kind of a thing so something similar is happening in the text world here that you have much much more difficult and very high end math uh Uh, which is being applied to creating you know very complex neural network processing so this is the part that has changed this wasn't available here uh, earlier the interesting part is all this math might have been available here because math is always you know like about a 100 year ahead of its needs that what what science needs today you already have the math tools available which were developed 100 years ago uh, for this purpose so that's the same thing here so all these techniques were there uh but the data to prove all that and you know like uh to validate many of those things has just been recently available i mean but yeah. the newer techniques of processing are the secret sauce which has just come out now yeah one other uh, i think there's a question but i'll just continue one more question then you sure. can take the last one from akash uh is that uh, you know so if people are using these tools to find patterns and recognize patterns 
which is what many of them are doing. Even in say, drug discovery, for example, yes. if you're trying to turn a lot of data to come up with candidates which could have a better chance of success, yes. right? What uh, everybody will be tempted to do would be present it as non-obvious hits, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> those without any mention of AI, right? Yeah. Although the data are data is created but, by AI. Yes, what will I be mean, the consequence of that? In the sense, will will the examiner? I mean, this is a new way of say. Uh, you know, just like how simulations create ideas, but simulations often are said to be based on principles and therefore not uh, sort of it's deductive and not really inventive, right? Yeah. Uh, would the same kind of logic apply here as well? Yes, yes, very much. You know, authorship of some kind or linkage between a work product and its source is going to be completely blurred. God knows where, you know, like things have come from. People would be wondering that, uh, you know, like who actually created it. Plus, I mean, all this stuff which is created, it's a one-way transformation. You could not pick up today an AI-generated image and reverse engineer to its source. There are a number of people working on this that how would we be able to reverse engineer it to like its source that where did this come from? But given the vast, you know, diversity of uh, the data, the models, I mean, which are around for of training data and the tweaking methods, authorship or source identification is going to be a huge, huge problem. So people will pass on, you know, like uh, AI generated stuff as their own stuff. They'll say, okay, we just took some assistance from it. Just like you, you we use a spell checker in Word, right? I mean, that all right, word is assisting you to correct your spellings, I mean. So something like that is bound to happen. But let's, you know, uh, trust the human ingenuity to find newer solutions to newer problems, I mean. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, maybe you should unmute Akash uh, Mukta so that he can ask his question. Probably we should end on a note where you tell us how people can patent their inventions Uh and then we can talk about it. Akash, your question. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, so ours is a mobile health application. Okay. And uh, we connect to third-party external health devices. Okay, uh -huh. so we collect that data and we process it and we use machine learning and artificial intelligence. Okay. okay. So in our all our like invest investor meetings and like you know applications, a common question asked asked to us is like what kind of protection we have or what is our mode. But sir, like, and like, I have to summarize your session. Like, you know, it's very difficult to protect our machine learning and AI, uh, you know, components. Except the uh, the part where you mentioned the protectable components, where we have training data sets and training models. But I think still it's quite vague and in the, under Indian Patents Act or you know copyright. I don't think so. It's very difficult. So I think only protection we have is like, uh, you know, we can go to US and get it protected. But considering you know the cost and other implication. It's it's quite difficult at this stage. So as of now, like if you have to talk about protection we have, what protection we have, and like to my understanding, I think we are just left with like if somebody copies our you know uh, like work, we just have to go to dispute and prove to the court that you know this is our original piece of work. Yeah. So I mean, the short answer to this is that software really hasn't worried too much about patents. I mean, because uh, for the fundamental reason that software is a black box. Uh, it's very very difficult to reverse engineer software. Uh, so if something is available as a black box, nobody is really concerned about, uh, you know, like the inputs and outputs being mimicked, I mean, uh, as such. So Google's, for example, Google's not worried about, you know, like people using its algorithm through APIs or anything as such, because, <coughs> excuse me, way google google's algorithm works is hidden behind you know like a black box nobody like really knows how to reverse so if you the mode that you have is essentially if your stuff is not reverse engine it cannot be reverse engineer easily then you are fine i mean and ai gives you even more difficult black box to break into earlier you had software you know like uh like a code in written in say python and you know you had uh, like the interpreter generating certain object code and you could reverse engineer it at least at assembly level, I mean, you know, into uh, like what it was trying to do. But something like this would be very impossible to 
reverse engineer if it is using you know like live apis from some other sources uh while generating its output very difficult uh, then to gen reverse engineer it so the the short answer is create like a black box which would be very difficult to break into yeah so i think hasit uh, what you're telling them is that it is it is basically confidential know how trade secrets that they'll retain yeah right uh, but you know his point about uh, being uh, just as an add on if i can add see if it is patentable uh, in the us right uh, i would uh, also suggest that they shouldn't worry too much about the cost because you can actually plan it in such a way that you uh, hit the us uh, say uh, uh, only a 30 months after uh, you know your first filing in india and even yeah, if it is that's... not granted in india it doesn't matter you can still get the us card, yeah right? that's the i mean your uh, you know the pct system uh and it's doable that way i mean i agree with you yeah so as a practical uh, way for yeah as a tactic uh, or a strategy for patenting i think the pct is a good route uh, yeah. as such yeah and the other thing you mentioned about data being the real protection of course that's uh, that's of course key so yeah. probably good agreements which keep your confidential data to yourself is uh, is at the heart of Uh, also, yeah. some of these kind of uh, businesses where you're building such uh, software, so you need yeah, to just make sure your contracts are in order. Correct, correct. I think the bigger challenges are where you have to voluntarily disclose data, whether it's regulators or your joint venture partners or others, where you or even in within your development environment where you have to naturally kind of like you have to share that source or like you know all the data and all the details. that the risk is more of you know like the somebody opening door to that fort rather than you know like somebody actually like infringing your uh, invention yeah. yeah so uh, yeah any, so any other question uh, no i just wanted to remind everyone the feedback link is in the chat box so please do give your feedback for this session so we can incorporate your suggestions also if you wish to see the previous uh, sessions in this series as well as the current one it is available at the youtube link which is also there in the chat box yeah over yeah. to dr premnath yeah i think uh, that's fine asit i think i don't want to take too much of your time thank you very much thanks a lot uh, thank some of these questions are quite important for many of our innovators so sure. mukda over to you okay uh, let me thank asit formally for this uh, session uh, which we have concluded today and uh, thank you for joining us uh, also let me remind everyone we will meet again for the next talk in this series on 23rd of january which is also a tuesday two weeks from today and the topic is only anatomy of an investment agreement you will get your updates if you have uh, uh, if you have signed up for this series if not then please do register uh, for this series so also a reminder we will have the talk again at our pre decided uh, slot at 4 o'clock from 4 to 5 pm so thank you for joining us please do give your feedback and uh, thank you asit uh, thank you everyone thank you dr premna thank you mukta okay i'll I'll, i'll disconnect thank you thank you yes someone is asking whether the youtube link is correct yes it should be correct please yes. check again Yes.